So I want to start with a story. Lucas B is the, I'm going to call him Lucas B. Lucas B is the CEO of a multi-billion dollar retail company that was already in financial trouble when the COVID hit in early 2020. And he had been brought in a year earlier and he had a strategy for returning this company to profitability, which his board supported him, supported him in, but he was struggling. Now, from Lucas's perspective, he was facing a number of daunting obstacles, beginning with COVID. And when we began working together, I was his coach, but he was also part of a program that we deliver at the Energy Project called The Reckoning. When we began working together, he strongly resisted the idea that his own leadership was a central part of the problem. It didn't register on him that he was also facing internal obstacles. You know, I didn't take my uh, clicker, so therefore I can't go to the next slide. This is not unusual. <laughs> I have seen this with many, many more CEOs and senior leaders than I have not seen it. So I came to Lucas with a core premise. And the core premise was this, to, be a, to transform a company, you have to transform yourself. And to be a transformational leader, you have to become a bigger human being. Period. Full stop. And over the past 18 months, I've watched Lucas grow remarkably as a human being. And in turn, and no surprise, as a leader. And I've seen a parallel transformation in his company, which near bankruptcy two years ago had its most profitable year in many years last year. Now, I've been coaching CEOs and senior leaders for two decades. And in a fiercely complex and challenging era, I have found it is absolutely critical to help leaders understand how what they're feeling on the inside is profoundly influencing how they show up on the outside. And above all else, this reckoning, this reckoning that I hope is already something you've begun and that you will continue to do, it requires the humility to challenge the fixed beliefs, the biases, the habits, the fears, the rationalizations that are influencing all of us, but mostly outside our conscious awareness. Instead, for the most of the leaders that I've worked with, understanding the motivations for their behaviors, the motivations for their behaviors, and for what they're feeling inside is a vast, unexplored territory they usually have not valued very much. Now, I, th I, th I believe I'm speaking to a slightly different group here, but this is very much characteristic of the businesses and companies that I've worked with over the years. Now, consciousness, I'm a little low than conscious capitalism to start pontificating about consciousness, but consciousness isn't an esoteric concept. It simply means being conscious of more. Because in order for you to be more, you have to see more and feel more. You cannot change what you do not notice but noticing can change everything. Instead, most of us look out at a lens, through a lens at the world, and it's a partial lens, and yet we believe we're seeing the whole. Just to give you a quick example, so I'd like you to take a moment now to notice what you're feeling in your body. And specifically, I'd like you to focus on a place where you're feeling some amount of tension, or discomfort, or even sadness. In short, I mean a place in your body where you have some negative feelings. So go there. And how does it feel to feel that? 
And if you don't feel anything, is that because you push feelings away? Because whatever uncomfortable feelings you have right now are a gift to you. They're a message. They're a blinking red light about what's standing in the way of your bringing the best of who you are capable of being to the table right now, including being present with me. That's a gift. Now, we humans deceive ourselves when we assume that we're running our own lives consciously and deliberately. In fact, the vast majority of our behaviors happen automatically or in reaction to an external stimulus. Only 5% of our behaviors are consciously self-selected. Much as we don't want to believe it, much as we don't want to believe it, we're guided far more often by confirmation bias. So here's a brief exegesis on childhood development. As we grow up, we progressively develop a story about who we are and what we believe, and most of us spend the rest of our lives sticking to it. We hunger for certainty and simple answers, and especially so in times of uncertainty. And then the added challenge for leaders, and especially for CEOs, is that showing up as strong and confident, even as invulnerable, has long been considered a key element of the job. And it often becomes core to the identity of those who have that belief. So the problem is that too often I've got this and I'm good become just another way to defend ourselves from uncomfortable feelings. Especially one feeling. The secret that dare not say its name, grammatically I'm not sure if that's right, it could be the secret that dares not say its name, is that all of us struggle to a greater or lesser degree with whether we're good enough. All of us. 100%. And nearly all of us spend time and energy worrying about where we're falling short, where we might not be worthy. But that has a cost. Because the more time and energy you spend in defending your value, the less time and energy you have to create value on behalf of yourself, on behalf of others, and in the world. It's a zero-sum game, my friends. If you're spending $100 on defense, that's exactly $100 not available for growth. If you're rowing a boat across, the, across a, a body of water to deliver important cargo to a destination on the other side and your boat springs a leak, your progress toward your destination is interrupted. Instead, you have to spend your energy doing what? Bailing water to stay afloat. How much time do you spend bailing water? How much time do you spend bolstering yourself just to stay afloat? How much energy do you spend looking for confirmation of your value from the outside world through the results you produce, the money you earn, the recognition you seek, and the power you exert? because you can't truly feel it inside. The problem is that relying on external sources of value tends to generate diminishing returns over time. Much like cocaine or heroin, you have to keep upping the dose. More money, more accomplishments, more power, more recognition in an increasingly futile attempt to get the same buzz you once got. So my work with Lucas didn't focus so much on the tactical issues and the outcomes and the external events of, of his life, the, ex, the outcomes he was seeking and the external events he was working inside, outside, but rather on three more personal questions that influenced how he felt and the decisions he was making. So the first question is, what made you the person and leader you are? 
Not what makes you, what made you, the person and leader you are. Number two, who are you capable of becoming? Who are you capable of being? And number three, what's standing in your way? So Lucas's reckoning began with exploring who he really was underneath the persona he had so carefully cultivated to navigate the world. And what that required was uncovering what he stood for most deeply instead of being as he was, overly influenced by his desire to meet the expectations of others, to avoid conflict, to reach consensus, for things not to get too disturbing. It also meant noticing his opposite tendency. So when he began to feel anxious, he would step in and micromanage and spin about decisions and seek multiple iterations of, of uh, responses from a group for many people to the same problem, making them crazy. <laughs> but the more Lucas was able to observe his conflicting impulses without acting on them, to sit with his discomfort rather than creating discomfort for others, the more space he had to make deliberate choices as opposed to simply reacting. As Lucas's capacity to set clear expectations and then hold his team accountable to them increased, so did his willingness to empower others to produce outcomes without his involvement. He began to walk inside that tension. It wasn't one or the other, it was both. And his work included owning a concept I've talked about for many, many years, his unspoken role as the chief energy officer of his company. Why? Because as the CEO, he had and has disproportionate influence on everything people are feeling for better or for worse. In other words, he can have a better or a worse impact. Now, one of the most transformative lives in my own, transformative lives, one of the most transformative moments in my own life was the recognition in a very difficult moment some years ago that all the worst things that people had ever said about me and that I'd ever said about myself were not only true, they were far truer than I could tolerate seeing most of the time. But they weren't all that was true. They weren't all that was true. Just because I wasn't all good didn't mean I was all bad. And that was my equation. That's a binary equation. I was all of it. What Zorba, what Zorba the Greek referred to as the full catastrophe. Two primary, uh, two primary revelations helped Lucas to see himself and others from a more spacious perspective. So the first was the recognition over time that he didn't operate from a single self, as nearly all of us are led to believe we do throughout our lives. In reality, we have at least three separate selves, and they operate in a complex dance which is invisible to most of us. Now, this framework I'm about to talk about was developed uh, based on a model uh, from a guy named Dick Schwartz. No, not a relation. Uh, a psychologist. And he calls it internal family systems, or IFS. Some of you have probably heard of it. And the heart of the understanding both in IFS and in that difficult moment that I had those many years ago, is that when you can embrace all of who you are, you have nothing left to defend. Talk about freedom. Talk about liberation. The first self, which we're born into, is our child self which is full of innocence and wonder and spontaneity. You know it with your own kids when, when or if they are young. But the fact is that that child is also helpless, totally dependent on others to survive, and therefore and understandably easily terrified 
easily frightened. And whether we recognize it or not, this child lives on in us throughout our adult lives. It doesn't just go away when we, quote, grow up. It's there. Now, our second self, the defender, what I call the defender, arises early in our lives to protect that child self from emotions that the child feels overwhelmed by, feelings like hurt and shame and fear and vulnerability and loneliness. And imagine how overwhelming that is for a child who has no significant resources of their own to deal with any of those feelings. Now, the defender can be proactive, meaning it can take the form of a caregiver, it could take the form of an intellectual or an achiever. Um, but here's the thing. It's a persona. It's a persona. And they are roles that we create and navigate, we create to navigate the world. They're not actually who we are at the deepest level. Even the most high-functioning defenders are forever alert to threats to their worthiness. Even the caregiver, even the superachiever, are vigilant about anything that might topple them off the particular place where they find themselves. So think for a moment about how you react when you're feeling devalued. It's not pretty very often, is it? We don't react w well when we're feeling that way. Now, for Lucas, it was powerful to recognize that when his value felt as risk, when his value felt as risk, at risk, his defender became impulsive and reactive. That's why he showed up micromanaging or spinning or even lashing out. And when that happened, he behaved in ways, as I'm sure you've experienced, that he would later find himself regretting. Now, that aroused a second defender, his self-critic, which arose to admonish him for what he had just done. At the same time, Lucas began to appreciate that his defenders always, this to me is one of the most important points I'll make, that his defenders always had a positive motive. No matter how ham-handed they were, no matter how badly they behaved, they were trying to protect him. They were being asked to do a job that they didn't have the resources to do effectively. Which is why our defenders, and our defenders are what's up, the vast and overwhelming percentage of the time, deserve our compassion, not our judgment, which only makes them more defensive and more reactive. And that's where the third self comes into play. We call it the core self, which the truth is most of us only rarely experience. This core self is mature and calm and capable and compassionate. It never feels questioned. It never feels compelled to question its value because its value is never as, at risk. It's a intrinsic value and it sustains forever. Now, it may or may not come forward, but it is there for the taking. The core self now naturally has compassion for our defenders. And the more they can feel that, the safer they feel in standing back and allowing our core self to run our lives. What a deal that is. Energetically, the core self, or the energy of the core self, is akin to what Mihai Csikszentmihalyi referred to, what, 30, 40 years ago as flow. Those moments when you get so deeply absorbed in an experience that you lose your self-consciousness. Time slows down. You feel fully engaged in whatever it is you're doing, unfettered and alive, as Joni Mitchell would have put it. You're the vessel rather than the captain. The vessel rather than the captain. So as Lucas was more able to tap into the energy of this core self, he noticed that he became more self-regulated, more grounded, more connected to himself and to others, and more able to make reflective choices. Think for a moment about one of your own children. 
or a child you're close to, and how you responded, particularly for a young child, how you respond or have responded at your desk when one of them's feeling frightened or overwhelmed and begins to melt down. As an adult with more resources at your disposal, you have the capacity to soothe that child, to create a safe space, to help that child self-regulate and re-equilibrate. The same is true for the child within you, so long as your defenders are willing to cede some territory to your core self. That self, your most adult self, can take care of the child inside you just as you can take care of your own children. And that's because our core self is the only self capable of seeing the whole, of embracing our other two selves without judgment. Now, the second transformative insight for Lucas was that he wasn't limited to a single source of intelligence. In fact, we all have at least four sources of intelligence, of knowledge and understanding. The mind, the body, the heart, the mind, and the spirit, all of them are necessary to seeing the whole picture. We don't typically draw equally on all four of them. The one that Lucas primarily relied on, and that probably a lot of you do, because most leaders I've worked with over the years do, was his mind. It was the cognitive capacity housed in his brain's prefrontal cortex, and especially in his left hemisphere. It's our mind, and specifically, as I say, the left hemisphere, that gives us the capacity to think logically and analytically and sequentially, to set goals and work toward them, our mind is the intelligence as well that is mostly most valued in Western culture, and especially in business. And it's what mostly gets trained up throughout our lives. No wonder it's accessible to us. But the fact is we have these other three sources of intelligence, the heart, the body, and the spirit, which we're less likely to fully value, but which are all critical to making us more complete and more capable. Now, like a lot of leaders that I worked with, especially men, Lucas had limited access to his heart, meaning sensitivity to his own feelings and emotional needs and empathy for the feelings and needs of others. There's a great relationship uh, therapist named Terry Reel who talks about the idea that uh, Men lose their heart and women lose their voice. Each needs, and that's archetypal, so it's not to say that every man loses his heart or every woman loses her voice. It's to say that we do tend to choose up sides and one works better than the other when in fact we need both. So Andrew P. is another C-level uh, leader with whom I work and awakening the intelligence of his heart began with his willingness to explore the fears and discomfort that prompted his defender to push strong feelings away. Now, over time, Andrew discovered that he'd been holding his desire for human connection, for intimacy, at a distance, afraid that it would make him more vulnerable and get in the way of achieving his goals. And as he was able to draw on more of his core self, and his defenders lowered the wall, he noticed he started to build much more close personal relationships with his colleagues. And then he found that collaboration with them became so much easier and that conflicts got resolved so much more quickly. And then finally, there's the intelligence of the body. I was about to say, this is the one that we probably have least access to. I don't know if that's 100% verifiable, but it's certainly my own sense. It's the source, when we tap it, of our deepest intuition, of our gut feelings, of our instincts. Because, now, because the body is also the place that we store any trauma, any, any pain that we've experienced, our defenders often keep us at a distance from the feelings that we otherwise could get from our bodies. 
And the result is that we lose access to this unique source of wisdom. Our minds can justify and rationalize anything, almost any choice we make. Our bodies, if we listen to them, are a direct conduit to what's really happening for us and to a strong sense of what is right for us and what is not. My own body, I'm a body type. If you follow the Enneagram, I'm an eight, and eights are body types. My own body has always been uh, very reliable in speaking to me. The problem is I haven't always chosen to listen to it. And over the years, for example, I've hired dozens of people, and invariably, I get a strong feeling up front about whether it's going to work out with that person or not. And when that feeling is negative, and I choose to override it with my rational arguments to myself, it almost never works out well. So, the final source of intelligence is the spirit, which is the conduit to a sense of our deepest values and our higher purpose. The purpose that goes beyond our self-interest, Haley. Of all our sources of intelligence, the spirit is the most powerful in setting our direction and providing us a real true north. The intelligence of my spirit unwaveringly fuels me to do the work I do. I can feel myself drawing on it right now, big time. It's the joy of sharing something with so many human beings who have the resources and the power and the privilege to do so much good. And I can be in that with you. Now, conversely, when the defender gets activated, meaning our own worthiness starts to feel at risk, our access to that spirit to the concerns beyond ourselves, diminishes. My job as a coach, I've learned, and I'm, I apologize, this is taking me longer than I'm supposed to take, but I, nobody's going to yank me off the stage, I hope. <laughs> my job as a coach, I've learned over the years, is not to provide my clients with answers. It's not to fix them. It's to lead them back to themselves to all of who they are. Your defenders will never go away. You're human, after all. But over time, I can tell you, they can arise less often, less intensely, for shorter periods of time. And I can promise you this because it's my own experience. I've watched it in others, but I've experienced it in myself, and it's transformed my life. And when your defenders do arise, which they will, you will find that you're more able to tolerate them rather than act on their impulses or deny their existence altogether. So all this adds up to, here we are back there, a freer flow of energy, which allows you to draw more fully on all four centers of intelligence, the mind, the heart, the body, and the spirit. That's what happened for Lucas. His nervous system quieted down. His defenders were more willing or are more willing to step back. And the result is, he's better able to take care of himself, and no surprise, he's better able to take care of others. He is a bigger human being and a better leader. Now, this isn't about miracles or perfection. It's very simply about growth and evolution. We grow like crazy and evolve until we're 20 and grow very little relative to what Rand was saying about mindset. You get that mindset and then you stick to it. We grow very little in our adult lives. We build more skills. We have more capacities. But as to being bigger human beings, that's the exception. Because here is the amazing truth about all this, about seeing more and feeling more we already have all the resources we need inside ourselves right now. So if you'll indulge me at the end here, I'd like each of you to stand up. Now I want you to open your arms wide like this. I've learned that it's actually easier to smile when your arms are open like this. I always wondered why I couldn't smile, and now I can. 
And I'd like you to relax into a smile, at least a small one. Don't force it. Just allow it. Now I want you to cast your gaze across the room, and when you alight on someone, I want you to use your eyes and maybe a nod of your head to welcome that person here, to welcome that person. So take a moment to look around. Okay, now I'd like you to lower your arms, which are getting tired anyway, and put one of both, one or both of your hands on your heart. And now I want you to think back to that place of tension that you identified in your body at the start of this talk. Notice it again. How does it feel? If it's no longer there, notice somewhere else in your body where it is. Now, I want you to welcome this feeling, whatever it is, by saying out loud or to yourself, yes, this too. Yes, this too. And finally, I want you to think about someone who's causing you distress or difficulty in your life. And I want you to welcome that person the same way, by saying out loud or to yourself, yes, this too, this too, this too. As Walt Whitman said in the Song of Myself, I am large, I contain multitudes. So are you. The truth will set you free. The only question is how much truth can you tolerate? What is it you're not seeing? What is it you're not feeling? And who could you be if you did? That is your reckoning. At the end of Tony Kushner's Pulitzer Prize winning play, Angels in America, the character Pryor stands alone on the stage and reflects on the horrific wave of death caused by AIDS and the road ahead in the face of so much trauma, suffering, and loss. And this is what he says. This is what Pryor says. The world only spins forward. We will be citizens. The time has come. Bye-bye now. You are fabulous creatures, each and every one. And I bless you. More life. The great work begins. To all of you, to all of us, more life. The great work begins. Thank you.